This is continuing coverage of the trial of Karen Reed from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. Now, back to the courtroom. All right, are we all set with the screen? Okay. And again, um, and maybe better uh, with the lights on um, the structure. Maybe a little bit. If we could please uh, put the light back on. Uh, Lieutenant Gallagher, um, again, from this video uh, from approximately 9 11 in the morning, uh, do you recognize what's up on the screen? I do. If you could just uh, using that laser point direct the jury's attention to what, if anything, is significant you observed in this particular. A positive of this video. Uh, this is our, our Sally Port. Uh, you would come in Sally Port 4, exit Sally Port 3, like I said earlier. This is the vehicle they were executing a search warrant on, and this is the uh, crime scene tape. And as far as uh, personnel from the state police that were present there, uh, who, if anyone, was present there that you uh, knew or were, were aware of? I knew uh, Trooper Proctor was there. And I knew the criminologist was there and a photographer. I, I don't know them by name. Uh, so a couple of people from the lab, one taking photos, one uh, criminalist, is that correct? Correct. As well as uh, Trooper Proctor? That's correct. And do you know Trooper Proctor? I, know, uh, I knew of him. I don't believe I ever met him prior to this. Uh, he has worked some cases with our detectives. I knew he was assigned to the DA's office. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not sure if I ever met him prior to this case. Now, um, with reference to the vehicle, what, if anything, was placed uh, around the vehicle or did you observe around the vehicle when you saw it? Uh, this crime scene tape, as you can see, the yellow tape right there. And just to be clear, the sort of which part of the vehicle is, is sort of in the lower foreground of, of this vehicle? Uh, this is the passenger side rear of the vehicle. <laughs> Now, at some point uh, over the course of the time that uh, you were there on February 1st, uh, what if any other sort of uh, specialized units within the state police were, were also present? Um, eventually, the um, I think they call it the CARS team. Um, it's the what I would call their, I guess, accident reconstruction team uh, responded. Now, Ms. Gilman, if I could ask you to uh, fast forward within that video to uh, approximately 9.44 a.m.? That's fine. A little bit that. Right there. Now, Lieutenant, during this uh, part of the video, um, in addition to the people that you've already referenced, uh, who, if anyone else, was, was in the garage at that time? Um, it's, it's hard for me to say. say I, I believe this is the criminalist. I believe if uh, this is uh, Trooper Proctor, this is me with the gray shirt, walk, dress shirt, walking in. That is, that's me right there. And that's Trooper Proctor. I believe uh, the photographer or another criminologist is here. I, I don't know what their title is. Now, at some point uh, during the execution of this search warrant, uh, what, if any, uh, issues did you become aware of with regard to the criminal? Uh, they were having trouble. They were trying to remove the housing uh, to the taillight, uh, passenger side taillight, and they were having difficulty removing it. 
And uh, what, if any, assistance did you offer with regard to that? I told them that we had an officer working who was in charge of our fleet maintenance and our mobile operations unit who probably had the tools to do it. And he also had vast extensive experience in auto body. Who was that, sir? That's Officer Brian Wanless. And uh, what, if anything, did you do uh, with reference to Officer Wanless in, in regard to that area of the car? I asked dispatch to ask him to return at approximately, I think it was 950. And Ms. Kimmon, if I could ask you if you are not already there, uh, move it up to 951. If you can just pause it for one moment, Ms. Um, so with reference to uh, this particular portion of the video, Lieutenant, if you could direct the jury's attention to when you see Officer Wanless and, and uh, when you see him come over towards that area of the vehicle. And uh, Ms. Gilman, for your purposes, what I would ask is I uh, would run this from essentially 9.51 a.m. through to about 9.58 and 30 seconds. This is Officer Wanless right here. He examines it and he leaves momentarily. He dons a pair of gloves. And he exits and he's going to come back with some tools. Here he comes, <clears throat> he places his toolkit on the tailgate. Objection, Your Honor. Okay, pause and ask a question. <clears throat> and from uh, your review of this video, what, if anything, do you observe Officer Wanless do uh, with reference to that rear passenger side tail light? Uh, he re enters the Sally port and with some tools that he places the, his toolkit down on the uh, tailgate of the Lexus. And what, if anything, do you observe him do after that? Uh, he begins to work on the housing of the tail light. Just come in if you could uh, press, press. Now, Lieutenant, with respect uh, to uh, the item <coughs> that you and the other officers recovered from 34 Fairview on the 29th, uh, the criminalist that was depicted in that video, is that who you gave those items to? I believe so, yes. You gave those items to her directly, correct? Yes. Now, as far as that particular, I believe you testified earlier that you were looking to preserve biological matter, is that correct? Yes. And it's fair to say that your search of that area was confined to uh, sort of where it was described to you, Mr. O'Keefe, had been found, correct? That is correct. Now, turning back again just to February 1st, and sorry to jump around, but um, back to February 1st, at some point you mentioned there was a uh, crash reconstructionist from the state police, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, what, if anything, did you uh, aid or assist or facilitate with reference to uh, crash reconstructionist around the police station? When they wanted to test the vehicle, I secured the parking lot. I advised no cruisers to return to the station, and I blocked the entryway uh, with my mock cruiser and remained in my cruiser. 
And later on, uh, on that day of February 1st, uh, where, if anywhere, did you go with, uh, with respect to the crash reconstruction? Uh, we went to 34 Fairview. In addition to yourself and the trooper from the crash reconstruction, who, if anyone else, went with you? Uh, trooper Proctor was present. And uh, why did you go along with the troopers to that location? Uh, just so there was a, a Canton officer present. If any residents came out, I could communicate with them. And to your knowledge, had Trooper Proctor been to Fairview prior to that date? I have no knowledge if he had been there or not. <clears throat> what, if anything, did you direct either Trooper Proctor or the crash reconstructionist to once you were on scene? I brought him to the area of where Mr. O'Keefe was found. You showed them where Mr. O'Keefe was found? Yes. Now... Turning your attention uh, to, well, one on scene that day with uh, Trooper Proctor and the crash reconstructionist, what, if anything, uh, did you observe them to doing? Uh, they, I believe they were discussing, uh, they were trying to uh, place a drone up in the air, I believe, to map out the area. Objection. <clears throat> did you see that? Would you want me to strike the, I believe they were trying to? The, all right, so that will be stricken, but your observation will remain. Now, with reference, um, if I could draw your attention to February 4th of 2022, were you working that day? I wasn't. And at some point, did, uh, did you receive a call in regard to, uh, in regard to this case, this investigation? I did. And who, if anyone, called? Uh, Chief Berkowitz. And uh, what, if anything, did Chief Berkowitz indicate to you? Uh, he asked me if I was working. When I told him no, he asked who was. And who, if anyone, did you indicate to him was working? I told him Detective Sergeant Lank was working. And uh, as far as what, what, if anything, was that call in reference to? Uh, he stated he was driving in the area of 34 Fairview because of the warm weather and the warm rain in the last couple of days. And what, if anything, did he indicate? He, he believes. Sustain. I'm, I'm going to see you at sidebar, please. <laughs> and so, just to be clear, Lieutenant, you did not go to Fairview Road on February 4th, 2022, correct? I did not. I have nothing further for this one. All right, cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Uh, when was the first time you were ever interviewed about your conduct on this case, your involvement in this case? I, I don't recall. It was about a month ago, wasn't it? April 3rd, 2024? When I was interviewed by, I, I don't know who you're referring to. A formal interview by any law enforcement agency. Oh, I was never, yeah, until about a month ago, trial prep. I was not interviewed, correct. And that interview uh, was conducted by whom? I met at the DA's office with the prosecutor, uh, Adam Lally. And there was also a uh, state trooper there? There was. Lieutenant Tully? Correct. Okay. So Michael Proctor never formally interviewed you about your involvement in the case? No, sir. Never interviewed you about your involvement on the morning of um, January 29th, 2022? No, sir. Never interviewed you about your recovery of any physical evidence at the scene? No, sir. Which would include the blood stains as well as the uh, the piece of drinking glass. That's correct. Okay. Uh, never interviewed you about where that evidence ultimately went and how it made its way back to Canton Police Department. He never interviewed me. No. And 
His partner, Yuri Buknik, also, I won't go through the litany of things, never interviewed you as well. Correct. Um, and until February, I'm sorry, April 3rd, 2024, nobody from the DA's office had interviewed you either. That's correct. Um, did you write a report about your involvement in the case? Not on that particular day. Did you write a report after that? Yes. When did you write that report? Uh, possibly January 2023. I believe uh, it was the request for the uh, metadata, the acquisition of the photos report. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Did you ever, I, I'll, I'll narrow my question. Did you ever write a report about your involvement on the day at the scene? No, I did not. Okay. So that's not documented, at least by you, that's not documented anywhere. That's correct. Did you take notes? Uh, when you were at the scene? No. Did you go back to the station and memorialize your findings and your conduct at the scene by taking notes back at the station? No, I did not. So you have no notes and no report about anything that happened at Fairview on the 29th? Not myself, no. <clears throat> were you ever instructed by any superior? You're pretty high up in the ranks. Uh, you reported to whom? Uh, at that time, I reported to... Uh the chief of uh, deputy chief, chief of police. Right. Either the deputy chief or the chief. Correct. Uh, did either the deputy chief or the chief instruct you, uh, Lieutenant, don't worry about writing a report in this case? No, they never said anything like that. <clears throat> um, you would agree that it's one thing to respond to a scene. It's another thing to actually gather evidence at a scene. That's correct. Especially a scene where it's a potential, at that time, a potential homicide of a police officer. That's correct. Um, Part of the reason for annotating, memorializing exactly what evidence is recovered is so you can relay that to other officers, correct? Correct. So, for instance, in your direct examination just a few minutes ago, you said that you went back to the scene at one point. What was the date where the drone was considered? Uh, February 1st. You go back to the scene on February 1st. That's three full days after the event, correct? That is correct. After the incident. And you said, I directed them to where John O'Keefe's body was found, correct? Yeah, I showed them, yes. But in fact, you never saw John O'Keefe's body, did you? That's correct. Okay, so you were giving them information that you had no, about which you had no personal knowledge, correct? I had knowledge from other offices. Uh, I did not see John O'Keefe at the scene. He was transported to the hospital. That is correct, yes. Right. So you couldn't determine exactly how he was positioned, right? Not precisely. From head to toe, right? Not precisely. Where his arms or his hands were? That is correct, yes. Uh, he's a six foot two man, correct? I don't know. You don't even know that? I don't know his size, no. Uh, if I told you that he's over six feet tall, would you have any quarrel with that? If Mr. Lally told me, I, I would have, I would, I would take it as fact. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, for purposes of my question, you don't, you don't want to take my word for it, but for purposes of this question, assuming that he's over six feet tall, there's a, a better than six foot margin for where he would be situated in the snow, correct? From toe to head. Correct. And the details matter in a case like this. Any investigation, the details matter. Surely. Accuracy is vital in a homicide investigation, correct? Correct. You did find some blood droplets. We saw it on the screen, correct? Correct. You also found part of a drinking glass, correct? That is correct. Did you engage a, or did you endeavor to uh, make a diagram uh, of exactly where those items were found? No. You're aware, as a former, you were the former chief of detectives? I was a detective sergeant. Detective sergeant. Uh, you were supervisor over detectives. Correct. You're aware of what cross coordinates are in measuring a crime scene, correct? Yes. You take a stable ob ob item like a flagpole, for instance, that might mm -hmm. be one that doesn't move. You measure exactly from a compass position, exactly north or exactly west, a number of inches, maybe even down to meters and millimeters if you use that, that uh, instead of inches, using meters, right? Yeah, we don't employ that process. So you don't employ a process where you could measure something from a known item north, south, east, or west, and then measure it from another known item and have an exact cross point of where that's we don't. Going. We don't typically exercise in that in, in our investigative unit. 
You knew how to do that, though. Yes. I mean, you've been trained on how to do that. Yes. But you didn't employ that technique here. No. So the glass, where the glass was found, it's sort of an estimate. Sure. Yes. Okay. And where the blood was found, that's kind of an estimate also. Yeah, we would guess that would be where his body was, yes. Okay. Uh, you just used the word guess. Yes. Right? But if you had actually documented it using cross-coordinates, you wouldn't have to guess. You'd know exactly where the tip of his head was, where the tip of his toes were, correct? No. Why not? Because he wasn't there when we got there. With <clears throat> Fair enough. When I say you, I meant other officers. If someone had employed that before he was moved, they could have figured out exactly how he was situated, where he was in that yard, correct? It would never happen. Life-saving measures come first. The officers are not going to start measuring while first responders are conducting life-saving measures. It doesn't, doesn't happen. That's exactly right. But once the body was moved, for instance, Officer Seraph, who's literally standing there, could have said, okay, I just saw the tip of his head right here. He's now on the gurney. And he could have measured that, right? He could have, yes. And then he could have said the tip of his toes were right here, and he could have measured that. Yes. And certainly, when there's no life-saving measures at, at play, you could have done the same thing with the drinking glass and the blood spots. That's correct. And in terms of recovering those blood spots, I'll get back to that in a second, but in terms of recovering those blood spots, you indicated that you used uh, temporary evidence containers, correct? Plastic cups, I said, yes. <clears throat> Before responding to 34 Fairview, and you indicated that you were told to respond to 32 Fairview, right? That is correct. That was a mistake on either dispatch's part or something. Correct. You figured out where to go once you got there. You can tell by the emergency lights. It was Sergeant Good who contacted you, correct? That is correct. And you were at home at the time. That is correct. Which is why you needed to respond to Canton PD to get some some uh, foul weather here, correct? Correct. You also contacted Brian Albert's neighbor, gentleman by the name of Tom Keller, correct? That is correct. And you wanted to let him know that you were responding over to the scene. Yes, he was the lieutenant in charge of detectives at the time. Lieutenant in charge of detectives, and also the man who lived directly across the street. From Brian Albert, correct? Uh, I would say he's, he, there's two property lines he's directly across from, 32 and 34. Okay. But yes, that facility. Okay. Um, is there a reason that you didn't contact Chief Berkowitz on that day to let him know where you were responding? Why did you pick Lieutenant, I'm sorry, uh, Deputy Chief Kelleher? Uh, because that would be my next call. Like I said, he is the lieutenant in charge of detectives at the time. Uh, we were responding to uh, a possible crime scene, a un possible unattended death. Uh, he would be my he would be my call. The normal chain of command. Correct. Okay. But you knew at the time that Chief Berkowitz was actually out on leave, having been injured on duty in some similar way. I don't recall that. Uh, Chief Berkowitz is always present. <sighs> Um, not only did you respond to the scene, but you were either you were tasked by one of your superiors or you as the as the uh, ranking officer on. the I guess I should ask this first. Forgive me. Were you the ranking officer on scene when you arrived? Yes, sir. I was. So either having been tasked by uh, tasked by one of your superiors or because you were the ranking officer on scene, did you take over uh, the coordination of the preservation of that crime scene? Yes, I did. So others were sort of answering to you. Correct. Um, you indicated that you had never preserved a crime scene in the snow before. That's correct. 30 years plus, and you, your policing experience is here in the Boston area? Correct. Snows a lot? Sure. Uh, in 30 plus years, you've never processed a crime scene in the snow? No, I have not. Lucky you. Well, we don't typically process our own crime scenes. Uh, sometimes we use the state police. Sometimes we use uh, Plymouth County detectives. So save the state police or setting them aside because they were not tasked on this call yet. Right. You were then in charge of preserving this crime scene, right? That's correct. Um, what exactly did you do? If you can name the categories, what exactly did you do to actually preserve the entire crime scene? I'm sure I can... Uh 
tell you that I had uh, Sergeant Good uh, move all the cars so I could photograph the scene, documented by photo evidence. Um, I, or I told uh, Detective Sergeant Lake, make sure he has initial statements from everybody present. And um, I, that, that's basically what we did prior to searching the scene itself. With regard to Sergeant Lake, uh, you told him to make sure that we had statements your, your words, we had statements from all the witnesses that were at the scene. Initial statements, yes. Does that mean the people inside the house? Yes. Okay. Maybe people across the street, if there were people across the street? Uh, no, it didn't include them at the time. It inc included people that were involved uh, from the prior night's incident uh, outing, I would call it. At the time that you tasked Sergeant Lang with this responsibility, um, did you know personally, that you were standing on the property of Brian Albert? I did. <clears throat> did you also know that Sergeant Lank had an ongoing and a long-time relationship with the Albert family? Jackson. Did you know that? Uh, I know he knew them. Uh, I think you're mischaracterizing the relationship. Did you see a problem with having somebody who knew the parties taking the initial statements from those parties? I'm not at all. Sergeant Lank, not, no issue at all. Not in your mind? Not in my mind. <clears throat> uh, were you aware that before you got to the location, that Sergeant Lank had taken it upon himself to already make contact with the individuals in the house? Objection. I'm going to see you at sidebar, please. <laughs> Your Honor, may I? Uh, Lieutenant, just before we went to sidebar, I'd asked a quick question. Were you aware at the time that you tasked Sergeant Lank to go talk to the folks inside the house that he had already gone into the house to talk to? Yes, I did. You indicated that one of the reasons, I'd like to move back. I'm bouncing around a little bit. I apologize. I understand. One of the things that you talked about was the preservation of the crime scene and the lack thereof because of the inclement conditions. Correct. There was wind blowing from all directions. Yes. There was snow falling. Yes. It was icy cold out. Yes. Um, there was already snow accumulated on the ground, about four inches, you said. At least it was different spots because of the wind drifts. Um, wouldn't that be even more of a reason in a potential homicide investigation to adequately preserve the scene as best you possibly could? Of course. Wouldn't you want to, for instance, protect the area? You mentioned the tent. Yes. Wouldn't you want to make sure that anybody from the civilian side and or officers don't just start traipsing through the middle of the crime scene? Oh, yeah, that, that was all done. As a matter of fact, the, the first responders had, sorry, the EMTs had already done what they needed to do in the scene and Mr. O'Keefe had been transported to the hospital, correct? That is correct. So that was not a concern. No. So nobody needed to be inside that scene that wasn't authorized to be there. That's correct. Civilian or um, officers. That's correct. Who was it that told you specifically where John O'Keefe's body was? I don't recall specifically. I had a collaborative meeting with Sergeant Lank and Sergeant Good. Um, were you aware at the time that you had the meeting with Sergeant Lank that Sergeant Lank did not ever see John O'Keefe's body in the position? Yes, I did. I, I don't believe Sergeant Good did, to my knowledge. I believe uh, John O'Keefe may have been in the ambulance at that time. John O'Keefe, I'm sorry, I got a little confused. John O'Keefe may have been in the ambulance at which time? Uh, when some of the officers arrived. Okay. So if that were the case, then they wouldn't have any personal knowledge of where John O'Keefe's body was either. Uh, not to your precise locations, yes. Um, you mentioned the tent, uh, and you said that you, in, in an answer to a question by Mr. Lally, you did not go back to Canton PD to get the tent. You had a tent in your trunk or something? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Thank <clears throat> you. 
when you interviewed with Lieutenant Tully, did he specifically ask you, this is about a month ago, did he ask you about the tent? I don't recall. Would it refresh your recollection if you were to review just a small snippet of your report, of his report? Yes. About your interview? Yes. May I approach you on it? Yes. Get that and um, direct your attention to paragraph four. Tell me if you recognize that document. I don't recognize the document. It's the first time I've seen it. Fair enough. Uh, does it read the highlighted portion and tell me whether that refreshes your recollection about a uh, conversation you had with Lieutenant Tully about the tent? Okay, I, I did read, have... read it to yourself. Yes, okay. You've read that? Yes. May I approach? Yes. Thank you. Do you recall telling Lieutenant Tully? No, you can ask him what he rec if that refreshes his recollection. Does that refresh your recollection at this point? It, it doesn't change my recollection. You said you didn't recollect exactly what you told Lieutenant Tully about the tent. And I'm asking, does that refresh your recollection about what you told Lieutenant Tully about the tent? Yeah, that's not what I said about the tent. Okay, so you didn't say... I drove to Canton PD headquarters to retrieve a tent to protect the area where O'Keefe was found from falling snow, but never used the tent due to high winds. Uh, we didn't have a tent at that time. That wasn't my question. I'm being very specific. Did you say that to Lieutenant Tully? No, that was misinterpreted. Okay. So if he got that, if that's in his report, that's incorrect. It's not accurate. Correct. Okay. Was there, is there anything else that you read in that report that's not accurate? Um, you asked me to read the highlighted version. That's what I read. Um, I didn't see any. I didn't read any other part of the document. Let me have just a moment, Your Honor. Yes. You indicated <clears throat> still staying on the at the crime scene. On January 29th, you indicated on direct examination uh, that the area adjacent to the blood stains that you saw and the drinking glass that you found, that area was somewhat trampled by, you presume, the first responders, the EMTs. That's correct. Uh, you also indicated that you didn't see any other pr uh, signs of shoe prints going from the street to the house, correct? Correct. Uh, from the scene to the house, correct? From the scene to the house. Correct. Meaning, what, what, what do you mean when you say that, from the scene to the house? So, the house, you have the house, and the scene was to the far left, actually uh, on the property line with number 32. Oh. So, I didn't see any footprints. The only uh, other footprints I saw was where the officers walked around and put up the crime scene tape. Meaning, walking through the yard? Correct. And putting up crime scene tape. Correct. All right. And if somebody had, how many of those sets of prints did you see? Um, I, I don't recall. Did you photograph or seek to have anybody else photograph the area from the scene to the house? Uh, just those long shots that, that you saw in the exhibits. Okay. Uh, and the snow was actively falling at the time, correct? Yes. yes. So if there had been a print a couple of hours earlier, you very well might not see it. That is correct. Okay. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about the collection of the blood. Uh, you found what you thought was blood initially, right? That's correct. Pink in color, reddish in color. Correct. And you began the process of uh, removing layers of snow, in other words, dusting the area with a leaf blower. That's correct. Had you ever used a leaf blower in a crime scene preservation effort? First time. First time. Um, and you indicated your testimony was temporary evidence containers to collect that blood, correct? Yep. We utilized uh, cups, plastic cups. Those were red solo cups, right? That's correct. The same kind of red solo cup you drink uh, beer out of at a barbecue? Yeah, sure, you could. Objection, Your Honor. Strike. I'll allow it. There's nothing special about the red solo cup? Other than they're uh, plastic, nothing special. And where did you get those red solo cups? Uh, we got them from Lieutenant Kelleher. So, in other words, you got the 
to use your words, the evidence containers from a neighbor. Correct. He had some solo cups in his house. Now we asked him if he had any um, plastic containers, any type of plastic container uh, that we could utilize. <coughs> How far were you <coughs> from Kenton PD? From 34 Fairview to Kenton PD. Give me, a, give me an idea. Mile, mile and a half. So even in really bad weather, four minutes, five minutes, is that right, to drive? Sure. You didn't go back to Kenton PD to get actual evidence containers, correct? Uh, we wouldn't have uh, temporary plastic containers, that w what we were looking for. We're looking to take samples of snow. We wouldn't have had, I know for a fact we did not have those. If we needed bags, uh, needle containers, things of that nature, uh, we're all set. But as far as plastic containers that we wanted to utilize, we didn't have them. Do you have any glass containers? No. So Kenton <clears throat> PD does not have or utilize evidence collection containers that are plastic? Uh, we have needle containers that are plastic. Uh, we have uh, blood uh, swabs that are in plastic containers. But for what we wanted to take a sample, we did not have. So we improvised. <clears throat> My next question is certainly Kenton PD employs and owns sterile swabs. Correct. Sterile swab is in a container that's long, and the usually the swab is connected to the lid, pop it out, and then it's sealed. That's correct. And forensically <clears throat> stable, correct? Yes. And the reason that it's sealed and forensically stable, stable is so nothing can contaminate the sample, correct? Sure, yes. But just as importantly, the blood sample can't contaminate anything else. Correct. Did you go to Canton PD a mile away and get sterile swabs for the blood collection? Blood was frozen. We didn't think it would be viable. You didn't think it would be viable? Correct. If you touched the swab to cold blood, you think you might get some blood on that swab? I wasn't sure it would be efficient for testing. <clears throat> so what you did instead was you gathered red Solo cups from a neighbor, unsterilized, and scooped up the snow with what you thought the blood was and just carried them back to the truck? Nope. We took six samples, uh, individual samples. Our philosophy was we'll let the crime lab extract it the way they best see fit. Uh, those six samples were bagged and then transported back to Camp Police Headquarters and placed into evidence. Were they covered? Uh, no, not that I recall. They weren't sealed in any way? No. So if somebody sneezed over the top of one of those cups? Uh, they, they were sealed in a bag, brown evidence bag. At that time, nobody was going to sneeze over the cup. Um. <clears throat> Do you have a rough estimate of how many people handled those red Solo cups before they were used to collect blood evidence in this homicide case? Uh, you want me to estimate? Give me an idea. Sure, Sergeant Lank. No, I mean, I'm sorry. My question was a bad one. Before you took possession of the red Solo cups, do you have any idea how many people before you had handled those Solo cups? I, I, I took them out of a package, so probably none. How about before they were packaged? I assume Solo doesn't sell contaminated cups. I would say none. So they're certainly not forensically stable. They're not sterile. By your, I don't know what definition you're looking for, but I would agree. Um, do you think it's standard practice for a police department to borrow red Solo cups from a neighbor to gather evidence? Objection. You can go ahead and answer that, Lieutenant. Of course not. Nothing about the scene was standard. Right. Uh, the glass shard. I'll touch on the solo cups in, in just a second, but I want to talk about the glass shard of the drinking glass. Uh, you, were you the one that found the drinking glass? I was operating the uh, leaf blower and uncovered the glass, yes. So you were the first one. Well, I guess you couldn't tell me if you're the first one, but you noticed it pretty quick. I wouldn't say it was quick, but we, we uncovered it. Okay. Uh, and then there is a... You mentioned a CARS report in your direct examination. There was a report done of where some of these items were found, correct? 
uh, you'll have to clarify. I'm not sure, sure what, you, what you mean. Did you mention a CARS report, which is a, uh, a report of the crime scene, where things were located, mapping of those things? Uh, you objected. It was sustained. I never got to answer that question. <laughs> Touche. Um, Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Thank you. Just have to show you a document and see if you recognize that. I don't recognize it. I could tell you what it is. That's okay. If you don't recognize it, that's all I need. Your Honor, may I? Yes. Thank you. Are you familiar generally? Uh, I don't necessarily need to talk about this one, but are you familiar generally with cars reports? Not at all. Not at all. That's not sort of in your your framework. Not in my realm. Okay. Uh, are you aware that there is a process by which items of evidence are mapped, or they attempt to be mapped on a on a for a crime scene? Uh, I'm not. I don't do homicide investigations. I, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Um, again, with regard to where the blood drops were found, let, let me go back to one other question I had. You said you took six samples, correct? That's correct. Did you precisely indicate in any report or note or diagram exactly which blood drops were in which solo cup? I did not. Okay. As you were using that snowblower and you uncovered the glass cup and uh, more of the blood samples, at any point, uh, did you see a size 12 men's shoe black in color? No. At any point, did you see a man's baseball hat black in color? No. You actually dug out a portion of a, you didn't dig it out, you moved it with your foot, uh, or somebody did, a portion of the berm or the curb that separates the street from the, the yard, correct? That, that is correct. At any point along that curb line, did you see a men's shoe? Along the exposed curb line, no. Did you see it anywhere else? No. And you didn't see a hat anywhere else? No. You didn't see any bright red taillight material anywhere else? I did not. You did not see any clear taillight material? I did. Material. I did not. You did not see any black plastic material? No. You certainly didn't see 45 pieces of plastic material. I did not. If you had found a broken glass, if you, if you find a broken glass on somebody's yard in a situation like this, did that seem out of place to you? They were coming from a bar. It didn't seem totally out of place, no. At the time that you found the broken glass, would you ra uh, rationally think, well, maybe the rest of this glass is inside the residence? I uh, no. You did not think that. No, there was reason that I didn't think that. <clears throat> did you think that? Did, well, let me ask you this: Did you ever go inside the house to search for the other part of the glass? Absolutely not. Because you made up your mind initially where that glass came from. Objection. You can answer that, sir. No. Did you search the house for any other matching glasses? No, we were. No. As a matter of fact, you didn't search the house for any physical items, did you? Of course not. Is that because that house belonged to a Boston police officer? No, it's because it requires probable cause, as you know, which we did not have. Or at least you didn't think you had at that time. We knew we didn't have it. Did you seek it from a judge? I'm familiar with what probable cause is. Did you seek, prob did you seek a probable cause warrant from a judge? No, I did not. Right. Did you ask for consent to search the house? Uh, we, we wouldn't do consent, and that's in a death investigation. Yeah, that's, that wasn't my question. My question no, was... No, I did not. Okay. Is that because you were at the house of a Boston police officer? No, it's because we wouldn't do it. Because if consent is denied, we still don't have probable cause, and we still couldn't search the house. But you never asked, did you? Never asked. According to your interview with Lieutenant Tully, <clears throat> after going to the scene the first time, you then re returned back to Canton Police Department, correct? Yes. At that point, uh, you remember having a conversation with Chief Berkowitz, correct? That is correct. 
And you indicated that having that conversation with Chief Berkowitz, that was about uh, Canton Police Department recusing themselves. Uh, not doing any further investigative interviews, yes. And you indicated, actually, in that conversation that you agreed with Chief Berkowitz that Canton should be recused, correct? Uh, he agreed with me. <clears throat> Your assessment that, that the recusal should take place? Yes, it was. And he agreed? That is correct. Okay. And the reason for that recusal was because of the relationship between the Albert family and the Canton Police Department? No. What was the reason for the recusal? Um, the reason was we had a Boston police officer on another Boston police officer's lawn or property, and that property owner was the brother of somebody in our investigative unit. Okay. That's one way to put it. Another way to put it would be because of the Albert family having a relationship with the Canton Police Department. It has to do with Detective Albert having a relationship with his family. Right. Or the other side of that is his family having a relationship with Canton Police Department. Jackson, Your Honor. Sustained. Go ahead. Move on, please. What time was that conversation with Chief Berkowitz? It was uh, after, after 8 a.m. when we got back to the... Uh, Police Department. You then traveled back to 34 Fairview to interview the homeowners with Sergeant Lank? Sergeant Lank was doing the interviews, yes, but I accompanied him. Okay. Uh, approximately what time did you arrive at, back at 34 Fairview to engage these interviews? Approximately 9 o'clock. Were you and Sergeant Lank the, well, let me ask this. At that time, did you know whether Sergeant Lank had already gone into the home? Yes, I did. Okay. So you knew that you were not the first person to go in and make contact with the individuals inside the home. That was Sergeant Lank. Sergeant Lank and Sergeant Good, correct. Before you ever got there? Correct. Okay. Uh, did they show you any documentation, notes, or anything of those that initial interview? No. Do you know whether or not they took notes of that initial interview? I don't. Do you know whether they recorded that initial interview? Uh, I know they did not. Uh, you indicated that you personally knew Brian Alp. Is that right? I, I knew him uh, since I became a police officer, yes. And so in, you indicated that you had a professional relationship with him, but not necessarily a personal relationship with him. Correct. Did you know that he was in the house before you walked in the house? Uh, no, I did not. What was your personal interact? Uh, sorry, your professional interaction with Brian Albert before you walked into that house that day? It, previously, correct. Uh, so, I, in general. so in general, as a detective, uh, he was with the fugitive unit at one point. He was uh, helpful uh, when we had a fugitive we needed to apprehend in Boston. Uh, things of that nature, uh, job related things. <clears throat> had you ever? for lack of a better phrase, hung out with Brian Albert? Not a day. Never socialized with him? No. Okay. Not intentionally. It's possible if I went to a retirement party, could he have been present? Possibly, but not that I'm aware. But you had no social relationship with him? Zero. You indicated that there were five or six people inside the house, including Brian Albert and Jennifer McCabe. Is yes, that, right? that is correct. So you clearly knew those two people. I didn't know Jen McCabe. Uh, I know that uh, Sergeant Lake was going to speak with her. Uh, but I, I didn't know her personally. I never had a conversation with her. What was it about Jen McCabe that you recalled in, as opposed to the other four or five people that were in the house? Sergeant Lank was talking to her. You just remember that name? That's who he went to talk to. Got it. So he went back specifically with the intent of talking to Jennifer McCabe. That's correct. That's when you accompanied him. That is correct. Uh, was that interview recorded? No. Did you take any notes about that interview? I did not. Did you write a report about that interview? I did not. You said that there were, other than Brian Albert and Jennifer McCabe, there were three or four other people in the house. Yes. Were those three or four other people in the house at the time that John O'Keefe was found dead or dying on the lawn? I don't have the answer to that. Did you think that might have been an important thing to find out? Again, I... I didn't think of that at that time, and I didn't think it was important at that time. I knew that Sergeant Lank had already interviewed people in the house. You had a, what you knew at that time 
Lieutenant, was you had a, an officer, a Boston police officer, who was either dead or dying on the front lawn of a house with a bunch of occupants, and you didn't think that it was necessary to investigate or interview those occupants yourself? No, I did not. At that time, I wanted to not participate in investigative interviews. You did tell Sergeant, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lieutenant Tully in your interview with him, uh, you volunteered that Brian Higgins was not present when you went back to the house, correct? I didn't believe he was. What? You didn't believe he was? No, I don't recall Brian Higgins being there. Okay. I, I don't recall who the other people were pre at that time. But Brian Higgins was not one of them. I don't know the answer to that. He could have been. You, I can't I can't say with certainty. You know Brian Higgins? I do. Obviously, you know him well. I do. Matter of fact, you guys are, you occupy sort of the same space at Kenton PD, correct? That is correct. You might see him most days out of the week. No, but I know him. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, you've got a social relationship with Brian Higgins as well. I have been social with Brian Higgins, yes. So you know him professionally and socially. You can't tell the jurors whether or not he was in that home when you went back over there to interview individuals about a Boston police officer who had fallen and was either dead or dying on the front lawn. Objection. Go ahead and answer that, sir. I can't answer that question. I had no conversation with Brian Higgins, so I, I don't recall. You do know that on January 29th, well, let me ask you this. Foundationally, did you go back after that series of unrecorded interviews, did you go back to Canton Police Department and work the rest of the day? Yes. Uh, Brian Higgins was also at the station for nearly the entire day. Again, I, I don't recall that. You're aware that Brian Higgins has a, had been granted a key card for the station? Yes. And that's a, that's, I'm guessing that is a relatively rare thing if you're not a Canton police officer to have a key card and full access to the station. Uh, there were a couple of ATF agents that had that access, yes. Okay, but he was one of them. He was one of them, yes. Is that access restricted, Lieutenant? In other words, does his key card work, work the same as your key card? I, I don't know the answer to that. He would have, to your knowledge, he, he roamed throughout the station at will, correct? I don't know how he roamed. Uh, he's a very private person. Uh, you very rarely see him. He usually his habits where he'd go up a front uh, stairwell right to his office. Um, but his accent, I, I guess I'm struggling with the question. His access was not limited to your knowledge. I don't know the answer to that. I can't answer that to my knowledge. He could go into any door he wanted to. I would doubt it. You would doubt that it would be limited. I would doubt he'd have unlimited access. Um, the patrolmen don't have full access. It, it all depends by your grade. Where he's an outside agency, I'm sure he had limited access. Who has access to the sound board? Uh, he, the doors, only whoever's in the dispatch area, the overhead doors. There is uh, one uh, pedestrian door that everybody would have access to. So he would have access to that as well? Yes. Where is... Chief Berkowitz's office in relation to the rest of Canton PD, the fiscal building? Uh, the best way to describe it, I don't know if the jury is familiar with the building, but if you were looking from Washington Street uh, dead on, it's the top floor, far left office. And is that, I don't know this, I'm not being, um, it's not rhetorical. Is it three floors or two floors? So it's really three floors, but it's it's numbered uh, one, one A, and two. So he would be on two, three physical floors up. Correct. Okay, thank you. When you had the meeting that you earlier described with uh, uh, with uh, Chief Berkowitz, where you indicated that MPD needed to recuse itself, was that in his office or someplace else? I was in the office of the detective sergeant. Which is where? It's on floor 1A. All right, we're going to take a five, ten minute break. Back 
Okay, whenever you're ready, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, you had started to tell us who, at the scene, who handled those solo cuts. Can you describe that for us, please? Um, I handled them to the scene. Uh, Sergeant Lank collected the samples. Under your supervision? Yes. Did anybody other than Sergeant Lank handle those solo cuts? No. So once they were in his possession, uh, they remained in his possession until they were booked into evidence? They were bagged, placed in Sergeant Lank's vehicle. He transported them to Camp Police Headquarters, transported it into the office, and logged them in as evidence. Yes. Uh, did you watch all that happen? I did not. You did not. So you're presuming those next steps after he was out of your view? I know that because he told me so. <clears throat> well, that's hearsay. Move to strike, Your Honor. All right, I'll strike the end of that. Thank you. Not what he told you, what you observed. I did not observe him place it in evidence, yes. At what point did you lose sight of those solo cups? Uh, when I got in my vehicle to leave the scene. So once the solo cups were in his, you saw them go in the brown paper bag. That's correct. The evidence bag. Then you saw him go in the truck. That's correct. And at that point, you don't have any personal in information about what happened with solo cups. Personal observations. Until until I remove them from temporary evidence, I have no rec no recollection. Correct. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about once you were inside the home. You've already indicated that you did not seek a search warrant. You did not seek consent to search the home. Correct. That's correct. I, I, did you look around the house for any sign of a struggle or a fight? No. Did you go to the basement at all? No. Had you ever been in the house before that morning at 9 a.m.? Never. <clears throat> Sorry? Never. Okay. Did you go to the backyard? No. Do you know, did you personally observe whether or not that house has a bulkhead door that services the basement? I have no idea. Did you photograph any portion of the house? The front of the house. Sorry. Bad question. Good point. Inside the house, did you photograph any part of the house? No. Did you have a cell phone with you? Yes. Has a camera on it? Yes. So you could have photographed it. You chose not to. I would have needed permission or a warrant. And you got neither. That's correct. You sought neither. That's correct. Uh, <clears throat> did you photograph any of the individuals in the home for, no. for instance, for injuries or anything like that? No. Uh, did you or Sergeant Lank separate the witnesses before they were interviewed? Uh, there was only one witness he was interviewing. Who was that? Jen McCabe. Where was everybody else in the house? I believe they were all in the same area. The kitchen, I believe it was the kitchen. Those individuals were not taken to a different part of the house? Not that I'm aware, no. They were allowed to communicate with and among one another? Sure, yes. <clears throat> And I think you already answered this, but I'm going to ask it just to make sure I'm clear. None of that interview of Jim McCabe was not recorded in any way. Audio or video recorded? Correct. How long were you inside the house for that interview? Ten minutes, maybe. Other than Jim McCabe being interviewed, were any of the other witnesses inside that house asked any questions by Sergeant Lank or by you? No, not that I believe so. Not that I recall. Were you the person on February 1st who gave access to the Massachusetts State Police to the Sally Port? I was probably one of them. The Sally Port doors can only be opened by dispatch. Uh, did you approve or authorize those doors to be opened for purposes of MSP coming in, Massachusetts State Police coming in and processing that, that vehicle? I don't know if I specifically did it at that point, but I certainly would, yes. You knew that the vehicle had been in that Sally Port since January 29th in the afternoon, correct? I don't believe what point I knew it was in the Sally Port, but I did know it was there for days before, yes. Okay. And if it had been there from January 29th to February 1st, that's three full days. That's correct. <clears throat> from the time that that SUV arrived and was situated in the Sally Port, how many people had access to that truck, that SUV? How many people had access or access to the Sally Porter? Is that one? Are you asking one I'm of those? Um, I would say the entire department. Dozens? Yes, correct. Hundreds? 
No, we're very small. <clears throat> I don't know that. So, yeah, we're, so we're probably 45. 45. And just about every one of those 45 people would have access to that Sally Port and that SUV had they wanted to. Had they wanted to, yes. And that 45 doesn't include Brian Higgins. It probably does, but he would have access as well. Thank you. Those same individuals that would have access to the SUV inside the Sally Port very obviously would also have access to anything else that had been placed in the Sally Port along with the SUV, correct? That is correct. Did you photograph or cause to be photographed that SUV immediately upon its arrival <clears throat> into the Sally Port on January 29th? I wasn't working, no. Did anybody, to your knowledge, seek to photograph the condition of that vehicle immediately when it arrived at the Sally Port? I wasn't there, I, I can't say. You've certainly never seen any photographs from January 29th immediately when that SUV was brought into the Sally Port, right? Other than our evidence, I haven't seen any evidence in this case. You indicated that Massachusetts State Police was having some difficulty removing the light. We saw a short snippet of the video, correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh, who made the decision to even remove the taillight? Was that Canton PD or was it Massachusetts State Police? That, that would have been somebody within the state police. Okay. And then you contacted Officer Wanless to actually facilitate the removal of that light, right? I contacted dispatch to ask Officer Wanless to return. And you knew at the time that Officer Wanless was a sworn Canton police officer. That's correct. Uh, but Lieutenant Gallagher, you told us just a few minutes ago that you and the chief, actually you and the chief, agreed that the Canton Police Department was completely recused from this case and the investigation based on a conflict of interest, correct? Uh, no, you're spinning it. What I said was from participating in investigative interviews. So they could take part, Canton Police Department could take part in any other part of the investigation, according to you, with the exception of investigative interviews? We can open doors. We can facilitate things. Yes. <clears throat> there's, there's nothing. No. Yeah. Yeah. If, if it's an assist round peg, round hole. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So in other words, Canton Police Department, notwithstanding the conflict of interest, was still allowed to participate in the investigation of the Karen Reed matter. Uh, there was no conflict of interest. I, I said as parents, a conflict of interest. So you, we have to be careful. I didn't believe there was a conflict. I honestly believe we could have investigated this case. Well, but it wasn't the appearance of such a conflict. You also didn't believe that there was probable cause to search the house even. Jack, I know that. <laughs> that. That answer will stop. It's stricken and so is the question. <clears throat> So Canton Police Department was, in fact, at your authority, given permission to manipulate that light in terms of pulling it out of the, of the SUV, correct? Objection. Sustained. Canton Police Department was allowed to facilitate the removal of that light. Yes. And during the course of the removal of that light, that taillight was broken, correct? That's correct. And shattered. Yes. Parts of it that were falling onto the ground. I don't think there was anything falling on the ground at that point. <clears throat> so now we do have evidence that that taillight, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, was broken or broken more once it was inside the Sally Port in Canton PD's custody. You're going to have to rephrase that. I don't understand the broken more part. During the removal process, that mm -hmm. light was broken even more. No. May I approach you? Yes. Take a look at that photograph and tell me if you recognize it. I don't recognize the photograph. It's the first time I've seen it. Do you recognize what's depicted in the photograph? It's a broken taillight. Does that appear to be the taillight that was removed during the process that we saw in the video 
just a few minutes ago under direct examination. I'm, I can only assume it is. I've never examined the light. So you, you, can't, you can't assume. So can you answer the question, Lieutenant? No. You don't recognize it? No. Okay. And were you, I, I didn't see you on the video, but the, it was a very dark video. Were you there? Yes, I'm in the gray shirt. Okay. Were you there as Officer Wanless uh, was actually removing the taillight from the, the vehicle? Not sure. I, I'd have to watch the video again. Okay. Do you recall if pieces and parts were being broken off and shattered while he was removing it? Not at all. May I approach? Yes. Were you the person who actually recovered? I, I think you did answer this. You were not the person who knelt down and actually recovered the blood droplets. Correct. That was Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Lyon. That's correct. Um, when you gave the... Sorry, let me rephrase that. Was it you or Sergeant Lank that put the solo cups into the evidence bag? Uh, Sergeant Lank. Was that in your presence? Yes. Okay. Uh, how long before, after he put the solo cups in the evidence bag, did he put the evidence bag in his truck? Uh, seconds, less than a minute. And then how long did the truck sit there until he left or you left and you were no longer able to observe it? He left immediately. You were at the location on, at the, sorry, the location of the Sally Port uh, on February 3rd. You've already testified to that, correct? Uh, no, I testified February 1st. I'm sorry, my mistake. <clears throat> February okay. 1st. Uh, you, ind you also indicated that at your direction that Sergeant Lank booked the solo cups into the evidence locker. That's procedure, yes. Right. Uh, I understand it's procedure. I'm asking if he actually did it. Yes. Okay. Did you see a log of that? Excuse me? Did you see a log of that? Uh, I saw the police report. Which police report? Uh, the original um, call. Okay. Uh, and in that police report, he indicates that he took the solo cups back to Kenton Police Department and booked them into evidence, right? Uh, it was given a property number and assigned to temporary evidence. And when you give, when something is given a property number, is there a, an officer working that property area to assign the property numbers? Oh, no, the, the officer placing the property into evidence assigns the property number himself. I see. So that officer would assign a property number and physically place that into temporary, what's it called again? Temporary evidence until the evidence officer takes custody of it. Okay. Did an evidence officer actually take custody of these items? No, because it was being transferred to the state police, so it wasn't going into our permanent evidence locker. So where did those cups sit for the three days between January 29th and February 1st? In a refrigeration unit in temporary evidence. And is there a log to sign in and sign out to make sure that the chain of custody of, of uh, items like this are maintained? Uh, the, evidence, uh, the evidence officer keeps that log, yes. Okay. Is there any log, Lieutenant Gallagher, of these items being booked into the temporary evidence locker? Uh, there should be, but I don't know for a fact, but there should be, yes. I, I agree there should be. I'm asking you if there is. I don't know the answer to that. The fact of the matter is, there is no log or document or report ever showing that these items were ever booked into the temporary evidence locker at Kenton PD. Isn't that right? Um, I don't believe that's accurate. Do you have that evidence log? I don't. I don't have access to the evidence log. Could you get access to the evidence log? No. <clears throat> You're a supervisor at Kenton PD. That's Why would correct. you not have access to the evidence log? I think only um, two or three people have access to evidence. Who would they be? Uh, the evidence officer. Which is who? Uh, Paul DiGipetro, sergeant. Can you spell that for us, please? D-I-G-I-A-M-P-I-E-T-R-O. Who else? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, I'm assuming the chief of police. Um, chief Berkowitz, I would assume? Most likely. 
Yeah, uh, but I don't know. Uh, possibly, yes. Head of detectives? No. <clears throat> Any other lieutenants or supervisors? I don't believe so. I know I don't have access as a lieutenant. If there's no evidence log of an item being booked into evidence, that's a pretty good indicator that it actually never made it into the evidence log, uh, evidence locker, correct? Objection. Sustained. We do know that wherever it went, the blood items went back to, and the glass went back to Canton PD, correct? That's correct. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Briefly? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Lieutenant, uh, I'm going to ask you kindly to take a look at those four photographs, and then once you've had a chance to review them, just look up at me. And I'll ask you a couple. Did you see them? I, I don't know what was just handed to the witness. So. <clears throat> Why don't you go take them from the witness? Take a look. There you go. There's copies right here as well. Thank you. That's fine. Just four. Just four. Okay. Mm. May I approach briefly? Yes. Sure. Make sure. Sure. There's four or five. Okay. Take your time. Come on, sir. Do you recognize those photos, or what's depicted in those photos? Yes. Do you recognize the time frame uh, that those photos would have been taken? Uh, yes. Based on context? Yes. February 1st, correct? I have no idea if it was February 1st, but it would be between the 29th of January and February 1st. Fair enough. Uh, <clears throat> you want to make a publish? Okay. Do they have, have they been introduced? They have... They have not yet been introduced, Your Honor. I, I'm sorry, I'm, protocol wise, I messed that uh, step. I need to ask that these be marked as next in order. Okay. Uh, Is there a, any objection? No, Your Honor. Hold on, hold on. They're still being mocked, and the court reporter has to record everything you say. I'm going to try to go in the same order, so you might want to glance at this photograph. It may be better, uh, better visual for you. I'd like to ask you if you recognize what's depicted in this photograph, especially um, the area right down here on the right, bottom right. You see that white rag? I do. Lieutenant, if you take a quick, uh, a close look at that rag, I'm going to ask you to identify it on the photograph. Do you see a couple of little dark marks on what appear to be that? I see it on that screen. Better visual up there. Okay, fair enough. Um, what's the position of that rag as it relates to the vehicle in the photograph? It's the uh, rear passenger side. Right rear quarter panel, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, and is that, in fact, the SUV in question? I believe it is. Okay. Uh, the SUV that belonged to Miss Reed. I believe it is. Yes. Okay. Let's take a look at the. Excuse me. 
is this 37. 37, okay. Is this 37? Yes. Thanks. Your Honor, for the record, uh, we were just speaking about uh, item 37. Okay. Let's move to that. Yes, sir. Looking at 38, does that appear to be the same brag in the photograph? It does, yes. Okay. You see a shadow sort of looming over the top of the, of the photograph? I do. Given what you just said about evidence item 37, does that appear to be the shadow of the right rear quarter panel of the truck? I, I would guess it's the tailgate. So you can't guess? I would say it was the tailgate. Okay. The tailgate's up, maybe the tailgate's up at this point. Do you see a bag in the middle of the photograph? Yes. Can you read what's on that bag? Stop and shop. Okay. That does not look like an evidence bag, does it, sir? No. Matter of fact, it looks like a grocery bag. Correct. Is that right? Yes. So not a forensically stable item, correct? Correct. Certainly not sterile. Correct. Right? Correct. You know where that bag came from? I do not. Was that a bag that you supplied to Sergeant Lank? Uh, I do not know. Do not recall. Lank got the stop and shop bag. I do not know. Next photograph, please. 39. Taking a look at what's been marked as evidence item 39. You recognize what's in the middle of the photograph? Yes. What is that? Those are the plastic cups with the coagulated blood. Do you see on the top of the photograph the same rag? I do. With the same markings? Yes. That appear that those unsealed cups with blood, liquid blood in them are situated right near the right rear quarter panel of the SUV? In this photograph? They are to the rear of the vehicle, yes. And next uh, item, please. And this appears to be evidence item 41, I'm sorry, 40. You see the same white rag? Yes. And you see the same evidence bag, I'm sorry, stop and shop bag, correct? Correct. And it's filled with <clears throat> six solo cups. Correct with what appears to be liquid blood. Correct. Does that a photograph appear to be taken at or about the same place near the right rear quarter panel of the SUV? It's actually, I would say that uh, the mat is the mat to the entrance to the booking area, so that is probably a couple of feet behind the vehicle. Okay, uh, let's go back to evidence item number 37, which would be the first photograph. You see the rag in that photograph? Yes, I do. Okay, let's go to the next item. Now you see the map, and it's, uh, I'm sorry, I should note this for the record, that we're now looking at 38. You see the mat and the rag in this photograph? I do. And you see a tire on that map? Yes. That's a golf cart of some sort that belongs to the Canton Police Department? It's a Kubota, yes. A Kubota, thank you. Uh, looks like the, the rag is in the same spot? Yes. All right. So the blood inside the stop and shop bag is sitting right next to the right rear quarter panel of that truck, correct? You can see the rear tire. I, it's probably at least three feet from the rear. If you look at the top, I can use the marker here. <clears throat> this look, appears to me to be the rear tire, which would put this a couple of feet behind the vehicle. Understood. Okay, that's all I have. Lights. Uh, would you agree that having unsealed and unsecured blood next to the right rear portion of the SUV is a recipe for cross contamination? If I, you want me to speak to, if I could speak to this incident alone, that's a yes uh, or no question. Do you think okay, that's it's, it's not yes or no, but you, for your purposes, I, I would say yes. Okay. And in fact, could even be worse, for instance, not just 
inadvertent cross-contamination. If somebody wanted to touch something on that bag, on those cups, and then touch the vehicle, they could easily do that with that juxtaposition of the open blood next to the back of the, the rear of the car. Objection. Sustained. Lieutenant, if somebody was so inclined, it, that situation could provide an opportunity for evidence tampering, couldn't it? Objection. Sustained. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. <clears throat> I have nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Mr. Lally? It's just briefly, Your Honor. <clears throat> Uh, Lieutenant, if I could ask you um, a phrase that was posed to you a couple times during cross examination as far as recusal of of your department, um, how would you define that term in, in this specific sense? In this specific case? Yes. Um, we did not want to go on any investigative uh, interviews because one of our best investigators, name is Kevin Albert. He's the property owner's uh, brother, and we didn't think it would be appropriate um, if we were on those interviews questioning fam- his family members. Now, with regard to... Um, death investigations, specifically unattended death investigations. Uh, What, if any, role does your department really have when it comes to uh, to those? What, if any, jurisdiction uh, does your uh, department have versus the state police? Uh, The state police takes jurisdiction. They run the investigation. We assist them in any any way we can. We try to help out. Now, sir, you were asked uh, some questions um, in regard to... um, Well, you indicated uh, that in regard to the, the drinking glass that you located in the area where Mr. O'Keefe's body was, um, that it didn't come from the house. Why is that? I, I think I said, I, I believe we didn't think it came from the house at that time because they were out at the Waterfall Bar and Grill the night before. And the initial statements uh, from uh, detectives, uh, Sergeant Lank and Sergeant Good obtained uh, nobody put John O'Keefe anywhere but where he was found, and that included his girlfriend. Now, if I could take a step back just to the the state police jurisdiction over unattended deaths, uh, what, if any, assets uh, the state police have as far as investigative assets uh, that your department doesn't? Um, they have uh, far superior tools to investigate. Um, they, they have direct access to the crime lab. They have a CARS team that can do accident reconstruction. Now, with regard to um, with regard to the criminalist and, and turning your attention to February 1st of, of 20, uh, 22, when you're in the, the Sally Court, um, you mentioned that Officer Wanless came in with a toolkit to assist in removing a tail, correct? That's correct. And is it your understanding, essentially, he just removed a clip from the back of the tail light in order to take it out of the vehicle? Yes. I believe you can see our video just pops into the criminalist's hands. <clears throat> and as far as your review of that video, your observations that day, there was nothing about the tail light that was broken during that removal process, correct? Correct. Now, as far as... Um, Cross-contamination, you were asked about, uh, you indicated it was not a yes or no answer. But what, if anything else, uh, would you have to add? Uh, what counsel was depicting was the transfer of custody over to the state police. So the criminologist was handling it at that time. Um, the photographer was photoing it. Uh, the criminologist was transferring uh, the blood into their plastic containers. And that's why uh, I'm sure it was being handled by a criminologist. There wasn't going to be any cross-contamination. I wasn't concerned about cross-contamination. So that was a scenario that you were describing earlier in your direct examination uh, as far as 
you're turning those items physically over to the criminalist on February 1st in the Sally Port area. And they are converting them to their plastic containers, yes. Thank you, sir. Nothing further. Okay. Very briefly, you said that no one put John O'Keefe, none of the witnesses put John O'Keefe anywhere but where he was found. That's what you just said, correct? That's correct. So your investigative technique is just to ask a witness, how'd that dead body get there? And if they say, I have no idea, your job's just done, right? Objection. Sustained. If a witness says, we found him here, you just take the witness at their word? Objection. You can go ahead and answer that, sir. No, of course not. You might want to investigate a little further, right? Absolutely. And ask them questions. That is correct. Get search warrants. That's right. Look when there's the probable cause, we do. Absolutely. None of that was done here, though. No probable cause. Thanks. That's all I have. You are all set, Lieutenant. Thank you. Okay. Who is your next witness, Mr. Bell? Your Honor, the call with the call, uh, Sergeant Sean Good to the stand. Okay. And while the sergeant's coming in, I'll see counsel about scheduling. More raw courtroom coverage of the trial of Karen Reed is coming up from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Press subscribe so you don't miss a minute.